Monsieur Perron. Ni de Maupassant. George's father was sitting in an iron chair, watching his little son with concentrated affection and attention, as little George piled up the sand into heaps during one of their walks. He would take up the sand with both hands, make a mound of it, and put a chestnut leaf on top. His father saw no one but him in that public park full of people. The sun was just disappearing behind the roofs of the Rue Saint-Lazaire, but still shed its rays obliquely on that little overdressed crowd. The chestnut trees were lighted up by its yellow rays, and the three fountains before the lofty porch of the church had the appearance of liquid silver. Monsieur Perron, accidentally looking up at the church clock, saw that he was five minutes late. He got up, took the child by the arm, shook his dress, which was covered with sand, wiped his hands, and led him in the direction of the Rue Blanche. He walked quickly, so as not to get in after his wife, and the child could not keep up with him. He took him up and carried him, though it made him pant when he had to walk up the steep street. He was a man of forty, already turning gray, and rather stout. At last he reached his house. An old servant who had brought him up, one of those trusted servants who are tyrants of families, opened the door to him. "'Has Madame come in yet?' he asked anxiously. The servant shrugged his shoulders. "'When have you ever known Madame to come home at half-past six, monsieur?' "'Very well, all the better. It will give me time to change my things, for I am very warm.' The servant looked at him with angry and contemptuous pity. "'Oh, I can see that well enough,' she grumbled. "'You are covered with perspiration, monsieur. I supposed you walked quickly and carried the child, and only to have to wait until half-past seven, perhaps, for madame. I have made up my mind not to have dinner ready on time. I shall get it for eight o'clock, and if you have to wait, I cannot help it. Roast meat ought not to be burnt.' Monsieur Perron pretended not to hear, but went to his own room, and as soon as he got in, he locked the door, so as to be alone, quite alone. He was so used now to being abused and badly treated that he never thought himself safe except when he was locked in. What could he do? To get rid of Julie seemed to him such a formidable thing to do that he hardly ventured to think of it, but it was just as impossible to uphold her against his wife, and before another month the situation would become unbearable between the two. He remained sitting there with his arms hanging down, vaguely trying to discover some means to set matters straight, but without success. He said to himself, "'It is lucky that I have George. Without him, I should be very miserable.' Just then the clock struck seven and he started up. Seven o'clock and he had not even changed his clothes. Nervous and breathless, he undressed, put on a clean shirt, hastily finished his toilet, as if he had been expected in the next room for some event of extreme importance, and went into the drawing room, happy at having nothing to fear. He glanced at the newspaper, went and looked out of the window, and then sat down again, when the door opened. The boy came in, washed, brushed, and smiling. Perron took him up in his arms and kissed him passionately. Then he tossed him into the air and held him up to the ceiling, but soon sat down again as he was tired with all his exertion. Then, taking George on his knee, he made him ride a cock horse. The child laughed and clapped his hands and shouted with pleasure, as did his father, who laughed until his big stomach shook, for it amused him almost more than it did the child. Perron loved him with all the heart of a weak, resigned, ill-used man. He loved him with mad bursts of affection, with caresses, and with all the bashful tendernesses which were always hidden in him, and which had never found an outlet, even at the early period of his married life, for his wife had always shown herself cold and reserved. Just then Julie came to the door with a pale face and glistening eyes, and in a voice which trembled with exasperation, "'It is half-past seven, monsieur.' Perron gave an uneasy and resigned look at the clock and replied, "'Yes, it is certainly half-past seven. "'Well, my dinner is quite ready now.' Seeing the storm which was coming, he tried to turn it aside. "'But did you not tell me when I came in that it would not be ready before eight? Eight? What are you thinking about? You surely do not mean to let the child dine at eight o'clock. It would ruin his stomach. Just suppose that he only had his mother to look after him. She cares a great deal about her child. Oh, yes, we will speak about her. She is a mother. What a pity it is that there should be any mothers like her.' Perron thought it was time to cut short a threatened scene. Julie, he said, I will not allow you to speak like that of your mistress. You understand me, do you not? Do not forget it in the future. The old servant, who was nearly choked with surprise, turned and went out, slamming the door so violently after her that the lusters on the chandelier rattled, and for some seconds it sounded as if a number of little invisible bells were ringing in the drawing room. Eight o'clock struck, the door opened, and Julie came in again. She had lost her look of exasperation, but now she put on an air of cold and determined resolution, which was still more formidable. Monsieur, she said, I served your mother until the day of her death, and I have attended to you from your birth until now, and I think it may be good to say that I am devoted to the family. She waited for reply, and Perron stammered, Why, yes, certainly, my good Julie. You know quite well, she continued, that I have never done anything for the sake of money, but always for your sake, that I have never deceived you or lied to you, that you have never had to find fault with me. Certainly, my good Julie. Very well, then, monsieur, it cannot go on any longer like this. I have said nothing and left you in your ignorance, out of respect and liking for you, but it is too much, and everyone in the neighborhood is laughing at you. Everybody knows about it, and so I must tell you also, although I do not like to repeat it. 
The reason why Madame comes in at any time she chooses is that she is doing abominable things. He seemed stupefied and not to understand, and could only stammer out, Hold your tongue, you know I have forbidden you. But she interrupted him with irresistible resolution. No, monsieur, I must tell you everything now. For a long time, Madame has been carrying on with Monsieur Limousin. I have seen them kiss scores of times behind the door. Ah, you may be sure that if Monsieur Limousin had been rich, Madame would never have married Monsieur Perron. If you remember how the marriage was brought about, you would understand the matter from beginning to end. Perron had risen and stammered out, his face livid. Hold your tongue, hold your tongue, or... She went on, however. No, I mean to tell you everything. She married you from interest, and she deceived you from the very first day. It was all settled between them beforehand. You need only reflect for a few moments to understand it. And then, as she was not satisfied with having married you, as she did not love you, she has made your life miserable, so miserable that it has almost broken my heart when I have seen it. He walked up and down the room with hands clenched, repeating, Hold your tongue, hold your tongue, for he could find nothing else to say. The old servant, however, would not yield. She seemed resolved on everything. George, who had been at first astonished and then frightened at those angry voices, began to utter shrill screams and remained behind his father, with his face puckered up and his mouth open, roaring. His son's screams exasperated Perron and filled him with rage and courage. He rushed at Julie with both arms raised, ready to strike her, exclaiming, "'Ah, you wretch, you will drive the child out of his senses!' He already had his hand on her when she screamed in his face, "'Monsieur, you may beat me if you like, me who reared you, but that will not prevent your wife from deceiving you, or alter the fact that your child is not yours.' He stopped suddenly, let his arms fall, and remained standing opposite to her, so overwhelmed that he could understand nothing more. "'You need only to look at the child,' she added, to know who is its father. "'He is the very image of Monsieur Limousin. You only need to look at his eyes and forehead. Why, a blind man could not be mistaken in him.' He had taken her by the shoulders and was now shaking her with all his might. "'Viper! Viper!' he said. "'Go out the room, Viper. Go out or I shall kill you. Go out. Go out.' And with a desperate effort he threw her into the next room. She fell across the table, which was laid for dinner, breaking the glasses. Then, rising to her feet, she put the table between her master and herself. While he was pursuing her in order to take hold of her again, she flung terrible words at him. "'You need only go out this evening after dinner and come in immediately, and you will see. You will see whether I have been lying. Just try it, and you will see.' She had reached the kitchen door and escaped, but he ran after her, up the back stairs to her bedroom into which she had locked herself, and knocking at the door, he said, "'You will leave my house this very instant.' "'You may be certain of that, monsieur,' was her reply. "'In an hour's time I shall not be here any longer.' He then went slowly downstairs again, holding on to the banister so as not to fall, and went back to the drawing-room, where little George was sitting on the floor, crying. He fell into a chair and looked at the child with dull eyes. He understood nothing, knew nothing more. He felt dazed, stupefied, mad, as if he had just fallen on his head, and he scarcely even remembered the dreadful things the servant had told him. Then, by degrees, his mind, like muddy water, became calmer and clearer, and the abominable revelations began to work in his heart. He was no longer thinking of George. The child was quiet now and sitting on the carpet, but seeing that no notice was being taken of him, he began to cry. His father ran to him, took him in his arms, and covered him with kisses. His child remained to him at any rate. What did the rest matter? He held him in his arms and pressed his lips to his light hair, and relieved and composed, he whispered, "'George, my little George, my dear little George.' But he suddenly remembered what Julie had said. Yes, she had said that he was Limousin's child. Oh, it could not be possible, surely. He could not believe it, could not doubt, even for a moment, that he was his own child. It was one of those low scandals which spring from servants' brains. And he repeated, George, my dear little George. The youngster was quiet again now that his father was fondling him. Perron felt the warmth of the little chest penetrate through his clothes, and it filled him with love, courage, and happiness. That gentle warmth soothed him, fortified him, and saved him. Then he put the small, curly head away from him a little, and looked at it affectionately, still repeating, "'George! Oh, my little George!' But suddenly he thought, "'Suppose he were to resemble Limousin after all?' He looked at him with haggard, troubled eyes, and tried to discover whether there was any likeness in his forehead, in his nose, mouth, or cheeks. His thoughts wandered as they do when a person is going mad, and his child's face changed in his eyes, and assumed a strange look in improbable resemblances. The hall bell rang. Perron gave a bound as if a bullet had gone through him. "'There she is,' he said. "'What shall I do?' And he ran and locked himself up in his room to have time to bathe his eyes. But in a few moments another ring at the bell made him jump again, and then he remembered that Julie had left, without the housemaid knowing it, so nobody would go to open the door. What was he to do? He went himself, and suddenly he felt brave, resolute, ready for dissimulation and the struggle. The terrible blow had matured him in a few moments. He wished to know the truth, he desired it with the rage of a timid man and with the tenacity of an easy-going man who has been exasperated. Nevertheless, he trembled. 
Does one know how much excited cowardness there often is in boldness? He went to the door with furtive steps and stopped to listen. His heart beat furiously. Suddenly, however, the noise of the bell over his head startled him like an explosion. He seized the lock, turned the key, and opening the door, saw his wife and Limousin standing before him on the stairs. With an air of astonishment, which also betrayed a little irritation, she said, So you open the door now? Where's Julie? His throat felt tight and his breathing was labored as he tried to reply without being able to utter a word. Are you dumb? she continued. I ask you where Julie is. She, she has gone, he managed to stammer. His wife began to get angry. What do you mean by gone? Where has she gone? Why? By degrees he regained his coolness. He felt an intense hatred rise up in him for that insolent woman who was standing before him. Yes, she has gone altogether. I sent her away. You have sent away Julie? Why, you must be mad. Yes, I sent her away because she was insolent, and because, because she was ill-using the child. Julie? Yes, Julie. What was she insolent about? About you. About me? Yes, because the dinner was burnt and you did not come in. And she said, she said offensive things about you, which I ought not, which I could not listen to. What did she say? It is no good repeating them. I want to hear them. She said it was unfortunate for a man like me to be married to a woman like you, unpunctual, careless, disorderly, a bad mother and a bad wife. The young woman had gone into the anteroom, followed by Limousin, who did not say a word at this unexpected condition of things. She shut the door quickly, threw her cloak on a chair, and going straight up to her husband, she stammered out, "'You say... you say that I am...' Very pale and calm, he replied, "'I say nothing, my dear. I am simply repeating what Julie told me, as you wanted to know what it was, and I wish you to remark that I turned her off just on account of what she said.' She trembled with a violent longing to tear out his beard and scratch his face. In his voice and manner, she felt that he was asserting his position as master. Although she had nothing to say by way of reply, she tried to assume the offensive by saying something unpleasant. "'I suppose you have had dinner?' she asked. "'No, I waited for you.' She shrugged her shoulders impatiently. "'It is very stupid of you to wait after half-past seven, she said. "'You might have guessed that I was detained, that I had a good many things to do, visits and shopping.' And then suddenly she felt that she wanted to explain how she had spent her time, and told him in abrupt, haughty words that, having to buy some furniture in a shop a long distance off, very far off, in the Rue de Rennes, she had met Limousin at half-past seven o'clock on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, and that then she had gone with him to have something to eat in a restaurant, as she did not like to go to one by herself, although she was faint with hunger. That was how she had dined with Limousin, if it could be called dining, for they had only some soup and half a chicken, as they were in a great hurry to get back. Perron replied simply, "'Well, you were quite right. I am not finding fault with you.' Then Limousin, who had not spoken until then, and who had half hidden behind Henriette, came forward and put out his hand, saying, "'Are you very well?' Perron took his hand, and shaking it gently, replied, "'Yes, I am very well.' But the young woman had felt a reproach in her husband's last words. "'Finding fault? Why do you speak of finding fault? One might think that you meant to imply something.' "'Not at all,' he replied by way of excuse.' I simply meant that I was not at all anxious although you were late, and that I did not find fault with you for it. She, however, took the high hand and tried to find a pretext for a quarrel. Although I was late, one might really think that it was one o'clock in the morning and that I spent my nights away from home. Certainly not, my dear. I said late because I could find no other word. You said you should be back at half-past six, and you returned at half-past eight. That was surely being late. I understand it perfectly well. I am not at all surprised, even. But, but I can hardly use any other word but you pronounce them as if I had been out all night. Oh no, oh no. She saw that he would yield on every point, and she was going into her own room, when at last she noticed that George was screaming, and then she asked, with some feeling, what is the matter with the child? I told you that Julie had been rather unkind to him. What has the wretch been doing to him? Oh, nothing much. She gave him a push, and he fell down. She wanted to see her child and ran into the dining room, but stopped short at the sight of the table covered with spilt wine, with broken decanters and glasses, and overturned salt cellars. "'Who did all that mischief?' she asked. "'It was Julie who—' but she interrupted him furiously. "'That is too much, really. Julie speaks to me as if I were a shameless woman, beats my child, breaks my plates and dishes, turns my house upside down, and it appears that you think it is all quite natural.' "'Certainly not, as I have got rid of her.' "'Really, you have got rid of her.' but you ought to have given her in charge. In such cases, one ought to call in the commissary of police. But, my dear, I really could not. There was no reason. It would have been very difficult. She shrugged her shoulders disdainfully. There, you will never be anything but a poor, wretched fellow, a man without a will, without any firmness or energy. She must have said some nice things to you, your Julie, to make you turn her off like that. I should like to have been here for a minute, only for a minute. Then she opened the drawing-room door and ran to George, 
took him into her arms and kissed him, and said, Georgie, what is it, my darling, my pretty one, my treasure? Then, suddenly turning to another idea, she said, But the child has had no dinner. You've had nothing to eat, my pet? No, Mama. Then she again turned furiously upon her husband. Why, you must be mad, utterly mad. It is half past eight, and George has had no dinner. He excused himself as best he could, for he had nearly lost his wits through the overwhelming scene in the explanation, and felt crushed by this ruin of his life. But, my dear, we were waiting for you, as I did not wish to dine without you. As you come home late every day, I expected you every moment. She threw her bonnet, which she had kept on till then, into an easy chair, and in an angry voice she said, It is really intolerable to have to do with people who can understand nothing, who can divine nothing, and do nothing by themselves. So I suppose, if I were to come in at twelve o'clock at night, the child would have had nothing to eat, just as if you could not have understood that, as it was after half-past seven, I was prevented from coming home, that I had met with some hindrance? Perron trembled, for he felt that his anger was getting the upper hand, but Limousin interposed, and turning toward the young woman, said, "'My dear friend, you are altogether unjust. Perron could not guess that you would have come here so late, as you never do so. And then, how could you expect him to get over the difficulty all by himself after having sent away Julie?' But Henriette was very angry and replied, "'Well, at any rate, he must get over the difficulty himself, for I will not help him,' she replied. "'Let him settle it.' And she went into her own room, quite forgetting that her child had not had anything to eat." Limousin immediately set to work to help his friend. He picked up the broken glasses which strewed the table and took them out, replaced the plates and knives and forks, and put the child into his high chair, while Perron went to look for the chambermaid to wait at table. The girl came in in great astonishment, as she had heard nothing in George's room, where she had been working. She soon, however, brought in the soup, a burnt leg of mutton, and mashed potatoes. Perron sat by the side of the child, very much upset and distressed at all that had happened. He gave the boy his dinner and endeavored to eat something himself, but he could only swallow with an effort as his throat felt paralyzed. By degrees, he was seized with an insane desire to look at Limousin, who was sitting opposite to him, making bread pellets, to see whether George was like him, but he did not venture to raise his eyes for some time. At last, however, he made up his mind to do so, and gave a quick, sharp look at the face which he knew so well, although he almost fancied that he had never examined it carefully. It looked so different to what he had imagined. From time to time, he looked at Limousin, trying to recognize a likeness in the smallest lines of his face and the slightest features and then he looked at his son under the pretext of feeding him. Two words were sounding in his ears, his father, his father, his father. They buzzed in his temples at every beat of his heart. Yes, that man, that tranquil man who was sitting on the other side of the table, was, perhaps, the father of his son, of George, of his little George. Perron left off eating. He could not swallow any more. A terrible pain, one of those attacks of pain which make men scream, roll on the ground, and bite the furniture, was tearing at his entrails, and he felt inclined to take a knife and plunge it into his stomach. He started when he heard the door open. His wife came in. "'I am hungry,' she said. "'Are not you, Limousin?' He hesitated a little, and then said, "'Yes, I am, upon my word.' She had the leg of mutton brought in again. Perron asked himself, "'Have they had dinner, or are they late, because they have had a lover's meeting?' They both ate with a very good appetite. Henriette was very calm, but laughed and joked. Her husband watched her furtively. She had on a pink tea gown trimmed with white lace, and her fair head, her white neck, and her plump hands stood out from that coquettish and perfumed dress, as though it were a seashell edged with foam. What fun they must be making of him, if he had been their dupe since the first day. Was it possible to make a fool of a man, of a worthy man, because his father had left him a little money? Why couldn't one not see into people's souls? How was it that nothing revealed to upright hearts the deceits of infamous hearts? How was it that voices had the same sound for adoring as for lying? Why was a false, deceptive look the same as a sincere one? and he watched them, waiting to catch a gesture, a word, an intonation. Then suddenly he thought, I will surprise them this evening, and he said, My dear, as I have dismissed Julie, I will see about getting another girl this very day. I will go at once to procure one by tomorrow morning, so I may not be in until late. Very well, she replied. Go, I shall not stir from here. Limousin will keep me company. We will wait for you. Then, turning to the maid, she said, You had better put George to bed, and then you can clear away and go up to your room. Perron had got up, he was unsteady on his legs, dazed and bewildered, and saying, I shall see you again later on, he went out, holding on to the wall, for the floor seemed to roll like a ship. George had been carried out by his nurse, while Henriette and Limousin went into the drawing room. As soon as the door was shut, he said, You must be mad, surely, to torment your husband as you do. She immediately turned on him. Ah, do you know that I think the habit you have got into lately of looking upon Perron as a martyr is very unpleasant? Limousin threw himself into an easy chair and crossed his legs. I am not setting him up as a martyr in the least, but I think that, situated as we are, it is ridiculous to defy this man as you do from morning till night. She took a cigarette from the mantelpiece, lighted it, and replied, 
but I do not defy him, quite the contrary, only he irritates me by his stupidity and I treat him as he deserves. Limousin continued impatiently, what you are doing is very foolish. I am only asking you to treat your husband gently, because we both of us require him to trust us. I think you ought to see that. They were close together. He, tall, dark, with long whiskers and the rather vulgar manners of a good-looking man who is very well satisfied with himself. She, small, fair, and pink, a little Parisian, born in the back room of a shop, half cocotte and half bourgeoise, brought up to entice customers in the store by her glances, and married, in consequence, to a simple, unsophisticated man who saw her outside the door every morning when he went out and every evening when he came home. "'But do you not understand, you great booby?' she said, "'that I hate him just because he married me, because he bought me, in fact, because everything that he says and does, everything that he thinks, acts on my nerves? He exasperates me every moment by his stupidity, which you call his kindness, by his dullness, which you call his confidence.' and then, above all, because he is my husband instead of you. I feel him between us, although he does not interfere with us much. And then, and then, no, it is, after all, too idiotic of him not to guess anything. I wish he would, at any rate, be a little jealous. There are moments when I feel inclined to say to him, Do you not see, you stupid creature, that Paul is my lover? It is quite incomprehensible that you cannot understand how hateful he is to me, how he irritates me. You always seem to like him, and you shake hands with him cordially. Men are very extraordinary at times." One must know how to dissimulate, my dear. It is no question of dissimulation, but of feeling. One might think that when you men deceive one another, you like each other better on that account, while we women hate a man from the moment that we have betrayed him. I do not see why one should hate an excellent fellow because one is friendly with his wife. You do not see it? You do not see it? You all of you are wanting in refinement of feeling. However, that is one of those things which one feels and cannot express. And then, moreover, one ought not. No, you would not understand. It is quite useless. You men have no delicacy of feeling. And smiling with the gentle contempt of an impure woman, she put both hands on his shoulders and held up her lips to him. He stooped down and clasped her closely in his arms, and their lips met. And as they stood in front of the mantel mirror, another couple exactly like them embraced behind the clock. They had heard nothing, neither the noise of the key nor the creaking of the door, but suddenly Henriette, with a loud cry, pushed Limousin away with both her arms, and they saw Perron looking at them, livid with rage, without his shoes on and his hat over his forehead. He looked at each, one after the other, with a quick glance of his eyes without moving his head. He appeared beside himself. Then, without saying a word, he threw himself on Limousin, seized him as if he were going to strangle him, and flung him into the opposite corner of the room so violently that the other lost his balance, and beating the air with his hand, struck his head violently against the wall. When Henriette saw that her husband was going to murder her lover, she threw himself on Perron, seized him by the neck, and digging her ten delicate rosy fingers into his neck, she squeezed him so tightly, with all the vigor of a desperate woman, that the blood spurted out under her nails, and she bit his shoulder as if she wished to tear it with her teeth. Perron, half strangled and choking, loosened his hold on Limousin in order to shake off his wife, who was hanging to his neck. Putting his arms around her waist, he flung her also to the other end of the drawing room. Then, as his passion was short-lived, like that of most good-tempered men, and his strength was soon exhausted, he remained standing between the two, panting, worn out, not knowing what to do next. His brutal fury had expanded itself in that effort, like the froth of a bottle of champagne, and his unwanted energy ended in gasping for breath. As soon as he could speak, however, he said, "'Go away, both of you immediately, go away.' Limousin remained motionless in his corner, against the wall, too startled to understand anything as yet, too frightened to move a finger, while Henriette, with her hands resting on a small round table, her head bent forward, her hair hanging down, the bodice of her dress unfastened, waited like a wild animal which is about to spring. Perron continued in a stronger voice, "'Go away immediately! Get out of the house!' His wife, however, seeing that he had got over his first exasperation, grew bolder, drew herself up, took two steps toward him, and, grown almost insolent, she said, "'Have you lost your head? What is the matter with you? What is the meaning of this unjustifiable violence?' But he turned toward her, and raising his fist to strike her, he stammered out, "'Oh, oh, this is too much, too much. I heard everything. Everything, do you understand? Everything. You wretch. You wretch. You are two wretches. Get out of the house, both of you. Immediately, or I shall kill you. Leave the house.' She saw that it was all over, and that he knew everything, that she could not prove her innocence, and that she must comply. But all her impudence had returned to her, and her hatred for the man, which was aggravated now, drove her to audacity, made her feel the need of bravado, and of defying him. And she said in a clear voice, "'Come, Limousin, as he is going to turn me out of doors, I will go to your lodgings with you.' But Limousin did not move, and Perron, in a fresh access of rage, cried out, "'Go, will you? Go, you wretches! Or else—or else—' He seized a chair and whirled it over his head. 
Henriette walked quickly across the room, took her lover by the arm, dragged him from the wall to which he appeared fixed, and led him toward the door, saying, "'Do come, my friend. You see that the man is mad. Do come.' As she went out, she turned round to her husband, trying to think of something that she could do, something that she could invent to wound him to the heart as she left the house, and an idea struck her, one of those venomous, deadly ideas in which all a woman's perfidy shows itself, and she said resolutely, "'I am going to take my child with me.' Perron, stupefied and stammered, "'Your your child? You dare talk of your child? You venture. You venture to ask for your child after—after—oh, that is too much. Go, you vile creature!' She went up to him again, almost smiling, almost avenged already, and defying him. Standing close to him and face to face, she said, "'I want my child, and you have no right to keep him, because he is not yours. Do you understand? He is not yours. He is Limousin's.' And Perron cried out in bewilderment, "'You lie. You lie, worthless woman.' But she continued, "'You fool. Everybody knows it except you. I tell you this is his father. You need only look at him to see it.' Perron staggered backward, and then he suddenly turned round, took a candle, and rushed into the next room, returning almost immediately, carrying little George wrapped up in his bedclothes. The child, who had been suddenly awakened, was crying from fright. Perron threw him into his wife's arms, and then, without speaking, he pushed her roughly out toward the stairs, where Limousin was waiting from motives of prudence. Then he shut the door again, double-locked and bolted it, but had scarcely got back into the drawing-room when he fell to the floor at full length. Perron lived alone, quite alone. During the five weeks that followed their separation, the feelings of surprise at his new life prevented him from thinking much. He had resumed his bachelor life, his habits of lounging about, and took his meals at a restaurant, as he had done formerly. As he wished to avoid any scandal, he made his wife an allowance, which was arranged by their lawyers. By degrees, however, the thought of the child began to haunt him. Often when he was at home alone at night, he suddenly thought he heard George calling out, Papa, and his heart would begin to beat, and he would get up quickly and open the door, to see whether, by chance, the child might have returned, as dogs or pigeons do. Why should a child have less instinct than an animal? On finding that he was mistaken, he would sit down in his armchair again and think of the boy. He would think of him for hours and whole days. It was not only a moral, but still more a physical obsession, a nervous longing to kiss him, to hold and fondle him, to take him on his knees and dance him. He felt the child's little arms around his neck, his little mouth pressing a kiss on his beard, his soft hair tickling his cheeks, and the remembrance of all those childish ways made him suffer as a man might for some beloved woman who has left him. Twenty or a hundred times a day he asked himself the question whether he was or was not George's father, and almost before he was in bed every night he recommenced the same series of despairing questionings. He especially dreaded the darkness of the evening, the melancholy feeling of the twilight. Then a flood of sorrow invaded his heart, a torrent of despair which seemed to overwhelm him and drive him mad. He was as afraid of his own thoughts as men are of criminals, and he fled before them as one does from wild beasts. Above all things, he feared his empty, dark, horrible dwelling and the deserted streets, in which, here and there, a gas lamp flickered, where the isolated foot passenger whom one hears in the distance seems to be a night prowler, and makes one walk faster or slower, according to whether he is coming toward you or following you. And in spite of himself, and by instinct, Perron went in the direction of the broad, well-lighted, populous streets. The light in the crowd attracted him, occupied his mind, and distracted his thoughts, and when he was tired of walking aimlessly about among the moving crowd— when he saw the foot passengers becoming more scarce and the pavements less crowded, the fear of solitude and silence drove him into some large café full of drinkers and of light. He went there as flies go to a candle, and he would sit down at one of the little round tables and ask for a bock, which he would drink slowly, feeling uneasy every time a customer got up to go. He would have liked to take him by the arm, hold him back, and beg him to stay a little longer, and so much did he dread the time when the waiter should come up to him and say sharply, "'Come, monsieur, it is closing time.' He thus got into the habit of going to the beer houses, where the continual elbowing of the drinkers brings you in contact with a familiar and silent public, where the heavy clouds of tobacco smoke lull disquietude, while the heavy beer dulls the mind and calms the heart. He almost lived there. He was scarcely up before he went there to find people to distract his glances and his thoughts, and soon, as he felt too lazy to move, he took his meals there. After every meal during more than an hour, he sipped three or four small glasses of brandy, which stupefied him by degrees, and then his head drooped on his chest, he shut his eyes and went to sleep. Then, awaking, he raised himself on the red velvet seat, straightened his waistcoat, pulled down his cuffs, and took up the newspapers again, though he had already seen them in the morning, and read through them all again, from beginning to end. Between four and five o'clock, he went for a walk on the boulevards to get a little fresh air, as he used to say, and then came back to the seat which had been reserved for him and asked for his absinthe. He would talk to the regular customers whose acquaintance he had made. They discussed the news of the day and political events, and that carried him on till dinner time, and he spent the evening as he had the afternoon until it was time to close. That was a terrible thought for him when he was obliged to go out into the dark, 
into his empty room full of dreadful recollections, of horrible thoughts, and of mental agony. He no longer saw any of his old friends, none of his relatives, nobody who might remind him of his past life. But as his apartments were a hell to him, he took a room in a large hotel, a good room on the ground floor so as to see the passers-by. He was no longer alone in that great building. He felt people swarming round him, he heard voices in the adjoining rooms, and when his former sufferings tormented him too much at the sight of his bed, which was turned down, and of his solitary fireplace, he went out into the wide passages and walked up and down them like a sentinel, before all the closed doors, and looked sadly at the shoes standing in couples outside them, women's little boots by the side of men's thick ones, and he thought that, no doubt, all these people were happy and were sleeping in their warm beds. Five years passed thus, five miserable years. But one day, when he was taking his usual walk between the Madeleine and the Rue Drouot, he suddenly saw a lady whose bearing struck him. A tall gentleman and a child were with her, and all three were walking in front of him. He asked himself where he had seen them before, when suddenly he recognized a movement of her hand. It was his wife, his wife of Limousin, and his child, his little George. His heart beat as if it would suffocate him, but he did not stop, for he wished to see them, and he followed them. They looked like a family of the better middle class. Henriette was leaning on Paul's arm, and speaking to him in a low voice, and looking at him sideways occasionally. Perron got a side view of her and recognized her pretty features, the movements of her lips, her smile, and her coaxing glances. But the child briefly took up his attention. How tall and strong he was! Perron could not see his face, but only his long, fair curls. That tall boy with bare legs, who was walking by his mother's side like a little man, was George. He saw them suddenly, all three, as they stopped in front of a shop. Limousin had grown very gray, had aged, and was thinner. His wife, on the contrary, was as young-looking as ever, and had grown stouter. George he would not have recognized, he was so different from what he had been formerly. They went on again, and Perron followed them. He walked on quickly, passed them, and then turned round, so as to meet them face to face. As he passed the child, he felt a mad longing to take him into his arms and run off with him, and he knocked against him as if by accident. The boy turned round and looked at the clumsy man angrily, and Perron hurried away, shocked, hurt, and pursued by that look. He went off like a thief, seized with a horrible fear lest he should have been seen and recognized by his wife and her lover. He went to his café without stopping and fell breathless into his chair. That evening he drank three absinths. For four months he felt the pain of that meeting in his heart. Every night he saw the three again, happy and tranquil, mother, father, and child, walking on the boulevard before going into dinner, and that new vision effaced the old one. It was another matter, another hallucination now, and also a fresh pain. Little George, his little George, the child he had so much loved and so often kissed, disappeared in the far distance, and he saw a new one, like a brother of the first, a little boy with bare legs who did not know him. He suffered terribly at that thought. The child's love was dead, there was no bond between them. The child would not have held out his arms when he saw him. He had even looked at him angrily. Then by degrees he grew calmer, his mental torture diminished. The image that had appeared to his eyes and which haunted his nights became more indistinct and less frequent. He began once more to live nearby like everyone else, with all those idle people who drink beer off marble top tables and wear out their clothes on the threadbare velvet of the couches. He grew old amid the smoke from pipes, lost his hair under the gaslights, looked upon his weekly bath, on his fortnightly visit to the barbers to have his hair cut, and on the purchase of a new coat or hat as an event. When he got to his cafe and new hat, he would look at himself in the glass for a long time before sitting down, and take it off and put it on again several times, and at last ask his friend, the lady at the bar, who was watching him with interest, whether she thought it suited him. Two or three times a year he went to the theater, and in the summer he sometimes spent his evenings at one of the open-air concerts in the Champs-Élysées. And so the years followed each other, slow, monotonous, and short, because they were quite uneventful. He very rarely now thought of the dreadful drama which had wrecked his life, for twenty years had passed since that terrible evening, but the life he had led since then had worn him out. The landlord of his café would often say to him, "'You ought to pull yourself together a little, Monsieur Perron. You should get some fresh air and go into the country. I assure you that you have changed very much within the last few months.' And when his customer had gone out, he used to say to the barmaid, "'That poor Monsieur Perron is booked for another world. It is bad never to get out of Paris. Advise him to go out of town for a day occasionally. He has confidence in you. Summer will soon be here. That will put him right.' And she, full of pity and kindness for such a regular customer, said to Perron every day, "'Come, monsieur, make up your mind to get a little fresh air. It is so charming in the country, and the weather is fine. Oh, if I could, I would spend my life there.' By degrees he was seized with a vague desire to go just once and see whether it really was as pleasant, as she said, outside the walls of the great city. One morning he said to her, "'Do you know where one can get a good luncheon in the neighborhood of Paris? Go to the terrace at Saint-Germain. It is delightful there.' He had been there formerly, just when he became engaged." He made up his mind to go there again, and he chose a Sunday, for no special reason, but merely because people generally do go out on Sundays, even when they had nothing to do all week. And so one Sunday morning he went to Saint-Germain. 
He felt low-spirited and vexed at having yielded to that new longing and at having broken through his usual habits. He was thirsty. He would have liked to get out at every station and sit down in the café, which he saw outside, and drink a bock or two, and then take the first train back to Paris. The journey seemed very long to him. He could remain sitting for whole days, as long as he had the same motionless objects before his eyes, but he found it very trying and fatiguing to remain sitting while he was being whirled along and to see the whole country fly by while he himself was motionless. However, he found the Seine interesting every time he crossed it. Under the bridge at Chateau, he saw some small boats going at great speed under the vigorous strokes of the bare-armed oarsmen, and he thought, there are some fellows who are certainly enjoying themselves. The train entered the tunnel just before you get to the station at Saint-Germain, and presently stopped at the platform. Perron got out and walked slowly, for he already felt tired, toward the terrace, with his hands behind his back, and when he got to the iron balustrade, stopped to look at the distant horizon. The immense plain spread out before him as vast as the sea, green and studded with large villages, almost as populous as towns. The sun bathed the whole landscape in its full, warm light. The Seine wound like an endless serpent through the plain, flowed round to the villages and along the slopes. Perron inhaled the warm breeze, which seemed to make his heart young again, to enliven his spirits, to vivify his blood, and said to himself, "'Why, it is delightful here!' Then he went on a few steps and stopped again to look about him. The utter misery of his existence seemed to be brought into full relief by the intense light which inundated the landscape. He saw his twenty years of café life, dull, monotonous, heartbreaking. He might have traveled as others did, have gone among foreigners, to unknown countries beyond the sea, have interested himself somewhat in everything which other men are passionately devoted to, in arts and science. He might have enjoyed life in a thousand forms, that mysterious life which is either charming or painful, constantly changing, always inexplicable and strange. Now, however, it was too late. He would go on drinking Bach after Bach until he died, without any family, without friends, without hope, without any curiosity about anything, and he was seized with a feeling of misery and a wish to run away, to hide himself in Paris, in his café and his lethargy. All the thoughts, all the dreams, all the desires which are dormant in the slough of stagnating hearts had reawakened, brought to life by those rays of sunlight on the plain. Perron felt that if he were to remain there any longer he should lose his reason, and he made haste to get to the pavilion Henri IV for lunch, to try and forget his troubles after, under the influence of wine and alcohol, and at any rate to have someone to speak to. He took a small table in one of the arbors, from which one can see all the surrounding country, ordered his lunch, and asked to be served at once. Then some more people arrived and sat down at tables near him. He felt more comfortable. He was no longer alone. Three persons were eating luncheon near him. He looked at them two or three times without seeing them clearly, as one looks at total strangers. Suddenly a woman's voice sent a shiver through him which seemed to penetrate to his very marrow. George, it said, will you carve the chicken? And another voice replied, yes, mamma. Perron looked up and he understood. He guessed immediately who those people were. He should certainly not have known them again. His wife had grown quite white and very stout, an elderly, serious, respectable lady, and she held her head forward as she ate for fear of spotting her dress. Although she had a table napkin tucked under her chin, George had become a man. He had a slight beard, that uneven and almost colorless beard which adorns the cheeks of youths. He wore a high hat, a white waistcoat, and a monocle, because it looked swell, no doubt. Perron looked at him in astonishment. Was that George, his son? No, he did not know that young man. There could be nothing in common between them. Limousin had his back to him and was eating, with his shoulders rather bent. All three of them seemed happy and satisfied. They came and took luncheon in the country at well-known restaurants. They had had a calm and pleasant existence, a family existence in a warm and comfortable house, filled with all those trifles which make life agreeable, with affection, with all those tender words which people exchange continually when they love each other. They had lived thus, thanks to him, Perron, on his money, after having deceived him, robbed him, ruined him. They had condemned him, the innocent, simple-minded, jovial man, to all the miseries of solitude, to that abominable life which he had led, between the pavement and a bar room, to every mental torture and every physical misery. They had made him a useless, aimless being, a waif in the world, a poor old man without any pleasures, any prospects, expecting nothing from anybody or anything. For him, the world was empty because he loved nothing in the world. He might go among other nations, or go about the streets, or go into all the houses in Paris, open any room, but he would not find any door, the beloved face, the face of a wife or child, which smiles when it sees you, this idea worked upon him more than any other, the idea of a door which one opens to see and embrace somebody behind it. And that was the fault of those three wretches, the fault of that worthless woman, of that infamous friend, and of that tall, light-haired lad who put on insolent airs. Now he felt as angry with the child as he did with the other two. Was he not Limousin's son? Would Limousin have kept him and loved him otherwise? Would not Limousin very quickly have got rid of the mother and of the child if he had not felt sure that it was his, positively his? Does anybody bring up other people's children? And now there they were, quite close to him, those three who had made him suffer so much. 
Perron looked at them, irritated and excited at the recollection of all his sufferings and of his despair, and was especially exasperated at their placid and satisfied looks. He felt inclined to kill them, to throw his siphon of seltzer water at them, to split open Limousin's head as he every moment bent it over his plate, raising it again immediately. He would have his revenge now, on the spot, as he had them under his hand, but how? He tried to think of some means. He pictured such dreadful things as one reads of in the newspapers occasionally, but could not hit on anything practical. And he went on drinking to excite himself, to give himself courage not to allow such an opportunity to escape him, as he might never have another. Suddenly, an idea struck him, a terrible idea. He left off drinking to mature it. He smiled as he murmured, I have them, I have them, we shall see, we shall see. They finished their luncheon slowly, conversing with perfect unconcern. Perron could not hear what they were saying, but he saw their quiet gestures. His wife's face especially exasperated him. She'd assumed a haughty air, the air of a comfortable, devout woman, of an unapproachable, devout woman, sheathed in principles, iron-clad in virtue. They paid their bill and got up from the table. Perron then noticed Limousin. He might have been taken for a retired diplomat, for he looked like a man of great importance, with his soft white whiskers, the tips of which touched his coat collar. They walked away. Perron rose and followed them. First they went up and down the terrace and calmly admired the landscape, and then they went into the forest. Perron followed them at a distance, hiding himself so as not to excite their suspicion too soon. Perron came up to them by degrees, breathing hard with emotion and fatigue, for he was unused to walking now. He soon came up to them but was seized with fear, an inexplicable fear, and he passed them so as to turn round and meet them face to face. He walked on, his heart beating, feeling that they were just behind him now, and he said to himself, "'Come, now is the time. Courage, courage, now is the moment.' He turned round. They were all three sitting on the grass at the foot of a huge tree and were still chatting. He made up his mind and walked back rapidly. Stopping in front of them in the middle of the road, he said abruptly, in a voice broken by emotion, "'It is I. Here I am. I suppose you do not expect me.' They all three stared at this man who seemed to be insane. He continued, "'One would suppose that you did not know me again. Just look at me. I am Perron, Henri Perron. You thought it was all over and that you would never see me again. Ah, but here I am once more, you see, and now we will have an explanation.' Henriette, terrified, hid her face in her hands, murmuring, "'Oh, good heavens!' Seeing the stranger, who seemed to be threatening his mother, George sprang up, ready to seize him by the collar. Limousin, thunderstruck, looked in horror at this apparition, who, after gasping for breath, continued, "'So now we will have an explanation at the proper moment which has come. You deceived me, you condemned me to the life of a convict, and you thought that I should never catch you?' The young man took him by the shoulders and pushed him back. "'Are you mad?' he asked. What do you want? Go on your way immediately or I shall give you a thrashing. What do I want? replied Perron. I want to tell you who these people are. George, however, was in a rage and shook him and was even going to strike him. Let me go, said Perron. I am your father. There, see whether they recognize me now, the wretches. The young man, thunderstruck, unclenched his fists and turned toward his mother. Perron, as soon as he was released, approached her. Well, he said, tell him yourself who I am. Tell him that my name is Henri Perron, that I am his father because his name is George Perron, because you are my wife, because you are all three living on my money, on the allowance of ten thousand francs which I have made you since I drove you out of my house. Will you tell him also why I drove you out? Because I surprised you with this beggar, this wretch, your lover. Tell him what I was, an honorable man, whom you married for money, and whom you deceived from the very first day. Tell him who you are and who I am. He stammered and gasped for breath in his rage. The woman exclaimed in a heart-rending voice, "'Paul, Paul, stop him. Make him be quiet. Do not let him say this before my son.' Limousin had also risen to his feet. He said in a very low voice, "'Hold your tongue. Hold your tongue. Do you not understand what you are doing?' "'I quite know what I am doing,' resumed Perron, "'and that is not all. There is one thing that I will know, something that has tormented me for twenty years.' Then, turning to George, who was leaning against a tree in consternation, he said, "'Listen to me. When she left my house, she thought it was not enough to have deceived me, but she also wanted to drive me to despair.' You were my only consolation, and she took you with her, swearing that I was not your father, but that he was your father. Was she lying? I do not know. I have been asking myself the question for the last twenty years. He went close up to her, tragic and terrible, and pulling away her hands, with which she had covered her face, he continued. Well now, I call upon you to tell me which of us two is the father of this young man, he or I, your husband or your lover. Come, come, tell us. Limousin rushed at him. Perrant pushed him back, and sneering in his fury, he said, "'Oh, you're brave now. You are braver than you were that day when you ran downstairs because you thought I was going to murder you. Very well. If she will not reply, tell me yourself. You ought to know as well as she. Tell me, are you this young fellow's father? Come, come, tell me.' He turned to his wife again. "'If you will not tell me, at any rate tell your son. He is a man now, and he has the right to know who his father is. I do not know, and I never did know. Never. 
Never. I cannot tell you, my boy. He seemed to be losing his senses. His voice grew shrill and he worked his arms about as if he had had an epileptic fit. Come, give me an answer. She does not know. I will make a bet that she does not know. No. She does not know, by Jove. Ha! Ha ha! Nobody knows. Nobody. How can one know such things? You will not know either, my boy. You will not know any more than I do. Never. Look here. Ask her, you will find that she does not know. I do not know either. Nor does he, nor do you. Nobody knows. You can choose. You can choose. Yes, you can choose him or me. Choose. Good evening. It is all over. If she makes up her mind to tell you, you will come and let me know, will you not? I am living at the Hotel de Continent. I should be glad to know. Good evening. I hope you will enjoy yourselves very much. And he went away gesticulating, talking to himself under the tall trees, in the quiet, the cool air, which was full of the fragrance of growing plants. He did not turn round to look at them, but went straight on, walking under the stimulus of his rage, under a storm of passion, with that one fixed idea in his mind. All at once he found himself outside the station. A train was about to start, and he got in. During the journey his anger calmed down, and he regained his senses and returned to Paris, astonished his own boldness, full of aches and pains as if he had broken some bones. Nevertheless, he went to have a balk at his brewery. When she saw him come in, Mademoiselle Zoe asked him in surprise, "'What? Back already? Are you tired?' "'Yes. Yes, I am tired. Very tired. You know, when one is not used to going out, I've had enough of it. I shall not go into the country again. It would have been better to have stayed here. For the future, I shall not stir out.' She could not persuade him to tell her about this little excursion, much as she wished to. For the first time in his life, he got thoroughly drunk that night and had to be carried home. End of section 52. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio.